Hey, Jake from The Entrepreneur Ride Along here, back with another episode of the Online Business Case Study Season 1. This is Part 5. It's actually Part 5, which is all about scaling, but I'm going to break this up into two episodes here because there's a lot of aspects of scaling this business because, again, this business is currently operational. It's been going on since 2015, so I'm backdating a little bit here and going back through some of the things that I did at the time. Wish I did this case study live at the time, but of course did not think about this in 2015. So I'm breaking up part five here, scaling this business into two parts. This first part is going to be about scaling traffic and everything that I did to get traffic to this website and the strategic moves that I made along the way. Again, so far in this case study, we have covered the idea, validation, the launch, sales, all the beginning aspects in the first four episodes. Today, we're just going to talk about scale and what I did now that I had the idea, had some sales, launched out there, pre-sold, validated my idea, got those first sales and first courses out there. I knew I was onto something. I had this idea. Okay, now I need more eyeballs on my business, on my website, on my product so I can get more sales. So that is what we are talking about today. And if you are watching the video here, I'm going to go ahead and hide myself for the rest of the video. It's going to be slides. I might pop in at the end here for podcasts, just hang on, listen along, and I will go through the case study here for season one of the online business case study, talking about my business associate PI. And once again, you can follow along with the full case study at theentrepreneurridealong.com slash OBCS. That stands for online business case study. So theentrepreneurridealong.com slash OBCS to get all of the parts of this case study right there. Both the audio, the podcast version, the blog version, and the video version will all be right there. So let's start by looking at current day. Current day overview, we're talking 2022 right now, early in the year 2022. This business since 2015 has generated over $290,000 in total revenue, averages right around $5,000 per month in revenue. Now some months that jumps way up to ten dollars to $11,000 on a really good month. Sometimes it drops a little bit around 4000 but I can almost guarantee that every month without me doing anything, I'm going to hit $5,000 per month in revenue from this business at associatepi.com. In terms of traffic and email subscribers now, most of the traffic for this business is organic and organic meaning that it is coming from non-paid sources, people primarily out there on Google searching for topics related to these courses, these exams in the insurance industry that I sell study material for. They are out there searching for terms like the CPCU 500 exam, the CPCU 520 exam, the salary of a CPCU, the CPCU pass rates, things like that. And I write blogs and that's my primary means of driving traffic to this website. And so that is how I have been generating. I get about 5,000 unique visitors, unique users per month to this website. And if you're watching the video here, I have a screenshot of my Google Analytics, my ConvertKit email subscribers, and my gross volume of revenue as of April 22. Uh, just for some reference here, and, and my, my Google Analytics screenshot is a little messed up. You'll see some dips in here because I broke Google Analytics once or twice over the past couple of years, and you'll just see all of a sudden the traffic goes to zero for a couple of months because I, I didn't realize that Google Analytics stopped tracking. But that's why you see some little dips there. But otherwise, if you if you look at this image here, and I'll post in the show notes in the blog as well for this episode, you'll see that since, let's see, the screenshot goes back, it, it only captured a couple of years here, but this was back to 2018. I basically am flatlined at 5,000 unique users per month since 2018. I I bump up sometimes to around 10,000 per month on on big months or when I'm doing campaigns and promotions and and advertising. But I can almost guarantee that 5,000 unique users per month are going to visit my website. And I like to look at unique users. Google Analytics shows other things like sessions and page views. That doesn't mean too, too much to me, especially for this business where I just want to know, okay, how many individual people are on this website every month? Because then I can estimate my conversion rate. And I know that, okay, one unique person is going to buy one unique course. That's what I care about. Websites that use advertising and pay-per-click and have paid ad and had have uh, Google ads on their website where they care about page views and how many blogs people are looking at because that means they can get more potential ad clicks and ad revenue. That's somebody that might want to look at sessions and page views. I, I monitor that stuff, but I don't care too much about it. In Google Analytics, I'm pretty much looking at how many users do I get per month 
And what's my bounce rate? Bounce rate is how many people come to your website and then leave right away. That's a bounce. They come to your website. Okay, this is, this is not the content for me. I'm out of here. That counts as a bounce. So you want a lower bounce rate. And you can see in my screenshot right here, my bounce rate is around 30%. And that's really good. That is absolutely what I'm targeting because that means they come to my website. They're getting relevant content. They're staying on my my uh, blog. They're clicking around to a couple of pages, probably downloading my my free practice exam to get on my email list. And so talking about email list, I get about 150 to 300 new email subscribers every single month. Again, on the YouTube video and in the show notes, I got a screenshot of my ConvertKit overview here to show how many people per month are downloading my free practice exam. Just a little bar graph that shows it around 200 to 400 per month. And I have right now a total of 5,000 email subscribers in my ConvertKit account reading my daily emails about the CPCU exams. And that's where I'd say about 85 to 90% of my conversions are coming from are from my email list. People come to my website from organic traffic. They join my email list. They download my free practice exam, get on my email list. And then through a series of automated emails, I am pitching them, showing them, hey, I'm an expert. I know all about this. I've taken these exams. Oh, by the way, I created my own online courses with, with a couple of some sales messaging, obviously. I, I throw some sales emails in there along with the no like, and trust and, and value building emails that are just about free resources and free, free content through my email list. Those are the people that end up buying my courses because they know me, they like me, and they trust me. That's why they invest in my course, which is expensive. It's $425 for the, the big main course. So people are investing substantial, uh, substantial money here to buy my course. So they really have to trust me and know me and like me. And that number has remained pretty consistent. It's been climbing. It's probably gained an extra 500 to 1,000 email subscribers per year. But there is a good amount of churn here for people that subscribe and unsubscribe. But that's natural if you think about my business model here. Is people are downloading my practice exam and passing one specific exam. They don't need me for a long-term relationship. They are just trying to get done the certification and pass their exam. So they join my email list, get 30 to 60 days of email content about this one exam. Usually sometime within that 60 day to 90 day period, if they have taken and passed their exam, they have no more need for me. So they are going to unsubscribe from my list. And I want that. I want them to unsubscribe because I'm paying for them to be on my email list. They don't need my content anymore. If they're done passing their exams, they're done with my certification. They can unsubscribe. They don't need my emails anymore. Eventually someday, if they start studying again for a different certification, They'll come back and I'm okay with that. So because of that, you'll see some natural churn in here. If you look at the screenshot, you'll see a good amount of new subscribers every month, good amount of unsubscribes every month because people pass their exams. So they unsubscribe and that's great. But the good thing, what I really want to see is new people coming in the door because new leads every month means new sales every month. One new sale of one course means they're probably going to keep buying my courses and buy the next course and the next and the next after they pass their exam. So that's where we are current day. Now let's look into scaling and how I got here. And the way that I got here, the number one reason my website is so successful today is from SEO, that three letter acronym, SEO, stands for Search Engine Optimization. All that it really means is I write blogs about specific topics that I know people are searching for, and those blogs, because there's not a lot of competition here, and because I'm one of the only ones in this niche that really knows SEO and, and kind of what I'm doing in the online business space, I am ranking those blogs number one, number two, number three on Google. So for example, a blog like the topic CPCU 500, that's the name of one of the exams that I still sell study material for. There is a couple hundred people per month searching that term. They type in Google CPCU 500. Well, I went out there and wrote a bunch of blogs and created this little hub of content about the CPCU 500. So Google sees that. And it sees that people are visiting this page, liking this page, sticking around this page when they are searching the term CPCU 500. Other people are backlinking to it. I mean, other websites are saying that I'm writing about the CPCU 500 and they're coming in and saying, oh, this, this guy's talking about the CPCU 500. You know, uh, uh, check out his resources, resources. They link from their website to my website. Well, because of all that combined, Google bumps me up the rankings really, really high to the fact that Whenever you search CPCU 500 and some of these other keywords in my niche, I'm right there. You'll see associatepi.com in one of the top five search results. That means anybody that's searching CPCU 500, 
They're going to see me right in that, the top of that page. They're going to click my link and read my blogs, my resources. Then they download my free practice exam because they're on my website. And then I get to pitch them my products and services. But first thing first, I just want to get people to my website. And that is with organic search traffic utilizing SEO. Because I'm not a big brain name. I guess, well, I guess now I'm a big brain name. If, if you're looking for CPCU study material, you're, you're in this, you're one of my target customers. You probably hear my business thrown around. You probably hear that Associate PI is one of the, the big sellers study material. But at the time when I first started this website, I was a nobody. Nobody knew my name, my brain name, or who I was. So I just needed people to see me because they're not searching Associate PI. They're searching for specific keywords. I'll put a couple screenshots here in the YouTube videos and in the slide share and, and, I'll, and I'll post these on the show notes as well. But I'm just showing my Google search console results and I'm showing here that you can see like some of the top like big name keywords here, ARM certification, insurance designations, CPCU 540, that just the term CPCU, CPCU 500, CPCU pass rates. You can see here on, on the bottom right image here on this YouTube video, my position where I'm ranking number three on that page, number five on that page, number two on that page, number 1.1, which means I'm first page, number one result. You can see how many clicks I'm getting per month from each of those and how many impressions per month. You can see how that adds up. And now at the time when I started this website, I didn't really necessarily know what I was doing with SEO. In fact, that this is, I stumbled into SEO by accident. I knew that I needed to create content. I knew that I needed to put something out there that showed that I was an expert on some topics relating to the CPCU exams. I had my courses. I've launched it out there. I was blogging a little bit. I'd heard this, these, these phrases. I had heard about keywords before targeting low competition keywords. And I think I remember it was, it was, I think it was Spencer Hawes was the founder of Longtail Pro, which is what I use for my keyword research. And I put a screenshot of that in here as well. You can see the bottom left of the video here. I show you some of the, the criteria of, of terms in their search volume. And it's just an SEO tool that shows you competitive difficulty for giving keywords and the search volume for that keyword. So it gave me an idea for how many people per month are searching for specific topics within the CPCU niche and CPCU studying niche. And based on that, I could see that, okay, I'm going to write about the CPCU 500 difficulty. That one's being searched only a hundred times on Google per month, not a huge search volume but nobody else is out there writing about it. So if I write about that and use that keyword exactly on my page, which the first time I did it, I did it by accident. I just, what I actually did is I was on Google searching for CPCU and Google just gives you these common search phrases. So I typed in CPCU 500 and it recommended one of the top search results was CPCU 500 difficulty. And at the beginning, that's how I was getting ideas for the blog post that I was going to write. For me, it was simply to get content out there, prove I was an expert. I didn't necessarily know that it would be picked up by Google and rank number one, but I wrote about CPCU 500 difficulty. Within two or three weeks, that was already ranking number one because I was the only one on the internet that used the exact key phrase CPCU 500 difficulty. It was the title of my blog, is the URL of my blog. I accidentally did the proper on-page SEO criteria of having heading tags with a keyword in it. I used the keyword enough times. I did some external and internal linking throughout my website. And I'm just kind of doing this because I was helping. I just wanted user experience to flow. Because of that, Google picked me up and within three weeks I was ranking number one. And that's what I highly recommend people doing is it, I, I love SEO because there's a lot of low traffic and low competi competition keywords. You might find some high, high traffic ones, but most of the time there's keywords out there that are now 100, 150, 200 searches per month, which is not a ton, but if you write five of those blogs, 200 searches per month, you can get a thousand people to your website within the first month or two of operation, first month or two of operating this business. And that's exactly what I did. I started using Longtail Pro, as I mentioned, and I started looking, okay, what else are people out there searching for? And then I started writing blogs about every single CPCU exam, these specific long tail keywords like CPCU 500 difficulty, CPCU 500 practice exam questions and study guide, I think was one of the keywords, like a really long one, really, really specific, which means nobody else out there on the internet was writing that specific key phrase. So if I just used that specific key phrase, I would rank up there number one, number two on Google for that keyword whenever anybody searched it. And boom, there's my traffic. There's people on my website. That is how within the first month and two months of, of operating this business, 
I was getting substantial traffic over 1,000 people per month within the first couple of months of operating this business, which most people don't do because most people don't know how to utilize these keywords. I stumbled into it by accident, but now it's all that I use. I use it in all of my businesses. And because of that, that means I got leads because I set up my email list. And I know that if somebody lands on my blog once, they're probably not going to pay $400 for an online course the first time they ever see my website. So I need to utilize email marketing. I need to capture that lead, get them on my email list and nurture them and give them a bunch of free value and prove, hey, this stranger, this this dude on the internet that's talking about the CPCU is not going to rip you off. Oh, he's actually taking his exams. Oh, he actually knows what he's talking about. Here's all these resources. He's providing a ton of helpful content. Oh, he's got a course and it's around the same price as this other course. Oh, and his content looks better and streamlined and he explains it really well in plain English. Okay, I'm going to buy Jake's course because I trust him now. I'm going to use his stuff. That's how I'm converting people from organic traffic to leads, to warm leads, to buying customers. And it all starts with SEO and that traffic. And that's why scaling this traffic is so, so important. Now, the downside about this niche was I'm a little bit capped in the terms of it's a, it's a really specific niche. In the screenshot here on Longtail Pro, I'm showing that only about 8,000, I think it says 8,100 people here per month are searching the term CPCU and 2,400 per month are searching CPCU designation. So that's basically my market there. You can see it's pretty small. Plenty to generate substantial revenue on up to $10,000, $12,000 per month in income from this niche. But I'm kind of capped and that's why I've been really leveled off at about 5,000 per month, 5,000 users per month for a couple years now. Now, now that I'm kind of diving back into this business and, and using some new strategies and getting back to blogging, because I, I took honestly years off from this business where I just let it run passively and just let it do its thing and bring in traffic, email, and, and course sales. I'm, I'm kind of stepping back in now that I'm a full-time entrepreneur and I have time and I can invest in in uh, scaling these businesses and I have a team helping me out now. I'm starting to bump that traffic up and I think I'll be up to around probably more closer to 10,000 users per month within the next year or two based on some of the strategies that I'm using. That being said, I did a bunch of bulk blogs. I once posted them all out there and they've just been sitting for years and bringing in traffic, automatic 5,000 users per month because of SEO and using the strategy. And the trick is target those low competition keywords. Even if there's not a lot of traffic, you're going to get that traffic right away because nobody else is out there writing about it. And about 90% of my traffic is organic through SEO. So I'm not paying for anything. Well, I am now, but I don't need to, but 90% of my traffic is organic through SEO. And I I put together, I'm going to stop talking about SEO because I can go on for literally hours. I I do this in my membership. I have a whole course in the Entrepreneur Ride Along membership about how to use SEO, that free content out there. I got got enough out there talking about SEO that I don't need to go into any more in this case study here. So if you want to learn more, go to theentrepreneurridealong.com slash traffic that is where I put together what I call the 1K Challenge. It's a five-part video series. It's free to download. And I teach you the exact strategies that I use every time I start a business to get the first 1,000 unique visitors to your website utilizing organic traffic, primarily SEO. So it's exactly what I did with Associate PI and my other businesses to just right away within the first. It's, so it's a, it's a one-week challenge to do this work, but it takes about a month to kick in. So it's how I get within the first month with one week of work, literally an hour per day for one week to get the first 1,000 visitors to your website in that first month. So right away, you're getting eyeballs on your business, which is exactly what you need. That's over at theentrepreneurridealong.com slash traffic. But this just gives you a sense of from when I first started this website, I stumbled into SEO. I started getting traffic right away. I started using keywords. I started learning about SEO because I started accidentally getting organic traffic and that grew and grew from there. And that's primarily how I scaled my business through traffic is through search engine optimization. So that's first SEO and 90% of my traffic from SEO. That is primarily how I have scaled my traffic just posting. I I probably have over a hundred blog posts on my website. And that is how the traffic is coming in as people finding me organically through Google because of my blogging and using SEO. So SEO is the primary means of traffic generation, but it's not the only one. I say the other 10 ish percent of traffic comes from social media. Now, again, if you're watching the YouTube video, I've got little screenshots here of every social media platform that I've tried. 
And I'll be honest, they have not all worked because it's a unique niche here that people aren't out there on Facebook excited to go learn about insurance and a CPCU designation. So Facebook doesn't really work for me. So I always recommend when people are starting out, I, it's SEO is always my primary. You, you got to have content on your website, use content marketing. I love SEO. That's how you get traffic to your website. That's, that's my number one recommendation. If it's possible, some niches, it's just not possible because it's so competitive. This one, low competition niche, SEO is the way to go. Social media. I always recommend start with one platform at a time. Don't try and do them all at the same time. I tried to do them all at the same time with associate PI. It didn't work. I, I was spread way too thin trying to do SEO, blogging, YouTube, Twitter, SlideShare, you know, LinkedIn, podcast, all these different things. And, and it was basically just that I was trying to do everything. So nothing worked. Instead, I figured out what was working. And, and this was after a couple of years of trial and error. I realized where my market was hanging out and focused only on that one social media platform. And that is what brought me in new leads, got me noticed, got me credibility, uh, and, and ended up being the one social media platform that I focus on going forward. And that platform is YouTube that it just naturally became where people wanted to learn about the CPC designation, because you can imagine somebody out there studying, searching a specific thing like, okay, yeah, uh, CBCU five, five, six tax questions or something like that. One of the difficult topics on this exam. I create a video about that, breaking down just five quick minutes. Hey, here's a, like a sample question. Here's how I would solve it. Oh, here's what you need to know about this one specific topic. And I've posted out there. Let's see. I think I have over 50 videos on YouTube right now and organically generating thousands and thousands of views. I mean, if you look at my associate PI YouTube channel, I have some videos up there that are two, three, four thousand. And there was actually a, a time period where I had to delete all my videos and redo them. So I probably, some of these videos have more like 10 to 15,000 views, but I'll talk about this later in the case study. I got in a little legal trouble at one point because I didn't properly use a disclaimer and trademark term on the trademark term CPC, which I, I don't own that trademark that's owned by the main organization that administers these certifications in this exam. So that's a later episode, a little sneak peek that that's coming later. But essentially, I had, to, I had to scrub all of my social media. This was around 2018. Delete every video, delete every Facebook post, every Twitter post, every podcast, every slide share. I had to start from scratch. So I know my numbers are actually a lot higher because this is a number since 2019 that I have some videos with three, four, five thousand views. I have almost 400 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, 50 videos because I ended up redoing all my videos and I, I redid all the slides, made them professional and, and went in and properly disclaimed and, and trademarked and all that stuff. But essentially my way of saying, I found out that people want to learn about the CPCU exams on YouTube because it, it's where I can train and educate and talk about concepts that they want to learn about. And also SlideShare because my presentations on YouTube I was creating a SlideShare, a, a PowerPoint presentation, which I would present on YouTube with an audio overlay. And I would just talk through these slides and help people study for their exam. Free videos, which are, which would then at the end, I would, I would pitch my free practice exam and say, hey, you liked this? Here's a free practice exam. And that has really good conversion that people watch the videos, get to the end and download the free practice exam. Just a call to action to my website, which you have to be doing if you are on YouTube. You need a call to action. SlideShare, though, which is an easy one for me. Now, SlideShare, if you haven't used it, is basically exactly what it sounds like, is you post a PowerPoint presentation out there. It's basically a slide presentation, and it's a social media platform where you can share slides, uh, PowerPoint presentations. The beautiful thing is that Google and uh, search uh, and, and platforms out there like, like Google, like Bing and, and Yahoo!, they can read SlideShare because it's a PowerPoint presentation. So they can read the text on the slides that you publish and it works for SEO. So you end up ranking on Google for the terms that you're posting SlideShares about. So when I post something like CPCU 500 review PowerPoint, if you search CPCU 500, you'll see my SlideShares in there in the search results and people find me that way. And in the early days, because my website was not as authoritative as something like SlideShare, which SlideShare is really authoritative and, and powerful, and they get a bunch of users on there. Google respects it more, had more domain authority compared to my website, which was brand new. 
in the beginning, my slide shares, some of my slide shares were ranking higher than my blogs because Google said, okay, there's this guy, Associate PI. He's brand new. I don't know if I trust him yet. Oh, but, you know, somebody posted on SlideShare. It's got a bunch of likes and views and downloads. All right, I want to put that in number one because it's talking about this CPCU 500 review. I know people are searching for that. Here, Here's a SlideShare that probably answers your question. Puts it number one. So my slide shares, similar to YouTube, have thousands and thousands of views, and it's just duplicate content. I, it, I didn't do anything extra. I took my YouTube video, took the slides from that video, and just published them to SlideShare. There we go, free content on a new social media platform. Those are currently my two big social media platforms. That's what I focus on. I tried Facebook for a while. I used Facebook ads. I was posting on Facebook daily. I used Hootsuite. Hootsuite offers a free plan where you can schedule your posts and it will post on like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. So I was scheduling them out there like once a week. I'd go in and post. I'd schedule like five to seven blog posts, just basically one per day. Uh, not blog posts, Facebook posts and Twitter posts and and uh, just trying to, to grow my following. Uh, I think on Facebook I have right now, I'm looking at the screenshot that I put in the slides. I have 181 people that like my Facebook page. I paid hundreds in advertising to get more and more likes, but it, it just simply came out to that my market's not on Facebook. My insurance employees studying for the CPCU exams are not on Facebook looking for CPCU content. They're going to Facebook for an escape, a social escape, and to interact with people socially and, and look at fun content, not the CPCU. So I haven't posted on, on Facebook, I think, since 2019. It just sits out there. Sure, there's some likes out there. I get some some engagement once in a while, but it, it's it's not worth my time at this point to maximize that. Same as Twitter. Twitter, I have about 244 followers, haven't posted since 2019 because, again, you look at the CPCU hashtag, there's not a lot out there. There is the main organization, but they're posting about fun things like, hey, here's your confirmment ceremony and celebration ceremony, and hey, here's this and that that you get to go to, uh, and, and networking events. Not a lot of people out there looking for how to study and pass these exams on Twitter. So Facebook, Twitter, tried them, didn't work, not my market. I learned, and so I stepped away, focused on what is working. I could still be wasting an hour or two per week on Hootsuite once a week, posting these Facebook and Twitter, uh, scheduling these posts, but... I, at this time, I, I got a little smarter than that, so I, I stepped away because I know where to utilize and uh, where I can spend my time to maximize my profit, which is not Facebook and Twitter. Now, I do do a little bit of podcasting. That's not necessarily social media, but I put that under here. That started, I would say, back in 2019 or after I went through this legal issue with the cease and desist and trademark, and I'll get to that later. I ended up posting podcast episodes out there. And I basically just took my YouTube videos. I took those same slides. I re-recorded them for better audio quality. I probably could have ripped the audio and used it for the podcast, but I wanted it to be a little more touched up. So anyways, I just used my slides from SlideShare. I taught the same exact content, and I posted a bunch of mini-series out there, four episodes per exam. So I just took every exam. Start with the CPCU 500. Here's part one, part two, part three, part four. CPCU 520, part one, part two, part three, part four. And I have now 50 podcast episodes out there, four or five episodes per exam. And I get about 300 downloads per episode there. And they're just organic. It sits out there. You don't have to post a weekly podcast episode. In fact, with none of my businesses, even the Entrepreneur Ride Along, I don't always do a weekly episode. It's evergreen content that sits out there. And when people are searching Google and they're searching their podcast directories and they're searching for something like CPCU, they're going to find you. And that's how people find me. They find me through podcast directories and just through Google searching, looking for information, audio, and visit video content for studying for the CPCU exam. So uh, podcast, just another one. And, and there I'm teaching the same exact content. I'm just giving some insights into what's important on this exam, what's difficult, what do you need to know? How do you pass? Here's my experience. Things like that that people want to know before they take their exam. And once again, I give a strong call to action at the end that says, download my free practice exam. Download this free exam, and I'll help you pass your exam. And so people end up downloading my free practice exam, get on my email list. That's the purpose of social media and content creation. I'm not out there to get followers and likes and subscribers. No, I want people to go from a social media platform to my website, from my website to my email list. And my email list is where I sell them. 
So every single thing you do on social media, every single thing I do on social media is to get them to my email list and my email list is where I sell them. So every time call to action, to go to the website, to download your lead magnet, because that's where you really care. That's where you convert people into buying customers. They're not going to buy straight from YouTube. You got to get them to, to, to your website first to, to buy something. So those are my social media platforms that I'm using. YouTube, SlideShare are the big ones. Podcast is a big one, not necessarily social media, but I, I included it in here. Facebook, Twitter didn't work, not my market. And the big one that you are probably thinking about is LinkedIn. Well, LinkedIn for the longest time, I could not use because I was restricted while working in my day job. I couldn't be out there on LinkedIn posting about my study material, trying to convince my coworkers to buy my study material that I was selling because that's a major conflict of interest. So I was not able to use LinkedIn until I left my job in 2021 and took on entrepreneurship full time. Once my, once my portfolio of online businesses surpassed my day job income, I, I left and I, I'm doing this full time now. Well, now's the time. Now I can go out there on LinkedIn and start utilizing that platform. I got a lot to learn about it and I'm going to share all that on in this case study later. Once I start playing with LinkedIn, I'll share that in this case study somewhere and I'll share it at the entrepreneur ride along.com when I'm learning and how to utilize this platform because I'm brand new to it. I've never used LinkedIn for business. So that is something that I will absolutely pursue in the future to get more traffic and build up my social media following. And I am confident it will bring in more sales. So that's social media. That's what I was doing on social. Those are my two main avenues of traffic, organic SEO and social media. Again, I'm not paying for anything on social media. So those are two free avenues of traffic and how I scaled up associate PI. And again, with social media, it took a couple of years. I started posting around 2015, 2016 and grew up that those views and subscribers and, and, and slide shares and everything that grew over time and just continued to bring in email leads. Now, one thing I did start playing with a couple of years back is paid advertising. I mentioned quick that I've tried Facebook advertising and that didn't work just because my market isn't on Facebook. I was having these Facebook ads run that would give away a free CPCU trial, my free course, my free practice exam. Basically, you click on the ad, it would take you to a landing page and I would try to get you to opt in to download my free practice exam and my free trial of my online course. And I, I posted my screenshot of Facebook ads here in the YouTube series. And you can see, I just wasn't getting any click through rate. My click through rates were like below 3%, barely getting any clicks, getting lots of impressions. Cause I was targeting people in the insurance industry. Oh, if you liked libertymutual.com or something like that, or, Oh, if you list that you write uh, that you, that you work as an underwriter, like that's who I'm pitching my ads to. So you're within my market, but yeah, I just wasn't getting good conversion. I could have played with it for a while, but it was it was kind of a waste of money, honestly. I spent around, looks like I spent close to a thousand dollars in advertising on Facebook ads. And I, I if I remember correctly, I didn't convert a single person from Facebook into a buying customer. I had some email leads, but they just never turned in anything. They weren't they weren't the right fit. And some people even emailed me and said, Hey, I this isn't what I thought it was, which I don't I don't know why you downloaded something that said free CPC practice exam if if it's not what you thought it was. But anyways, wasn't my market. Facebook ads didn't work. What did work and what I already knew is that my market was going to Google and searching specific key phrases to help them study for their exam. So Google ads is absolutely what worked. And I don't spend a lot on Google ads. I spend $5 per day. That's my strategy. And the purpose is to rank number one because the advertising spots get the number one spot. It does label it as an ad, but it's it's kind of sneaky what Google does to make it look like the top search results. So oftentimes people will see it and say, oh, okay, like this clearly answered my question. That's right what I searched for. Click on the advertisement. And, and what I'm doing is I am giving away my free practice exam, my lead magnet. Uh, you can see here, if you're watching the YouTube video, the bottom right here is actually my opt-in page where it's a free practice exam download. I do some segmentation in there, but you can see what my opt-in page looks like. And that's where I'm sending my Google ads traffic to this page because I want them to download my free lead magnet, get on my email list, because if they're on my email list, I know I have a higher chance of converting them into a paying customer. I have experimented with sending people right to the sales page, but like I talked about earlier, 
People need to warm up to me. They need to trust me. They need to know me before they invest $425 and buy my course because that's a big chunk of change. And you're really relying on me to have good study material to help you pass your exam. So instead of doing that because it didn't convert too well, I send people to my email list. You get on my email list, low barrier to entry. So basically you click on my ad, you land on this opt-in page, you download my free lead magnet. Okay, just give away your email address and you get a free practice exam. Great, that's easy. You're not asking me to spend $425. Then 30 to 60 days of emails convincing you why I'm the best thing ever and why you need to invest in my program. And that is where I get my conversions from. So Google Ads, that's all I'm doing, $5 per day. And I have a pretty low cost per click. It's about a dollar per click, depending on the keyword. And I, I posted a screenshot here of my Google Ads dashboard and since i've been doing this looks like i was doing it since 2017 i have over 8,000 clicks 380,000 impressions about a dollar and seven cents cost per click spent over eight thousand dollars on google ads and typically my conversion so that's about 150 dollars per month and that typically results in 500 or more dollars in profit per month it's typically two to three sales per month is what i get from google ads that's people that come in and maybe buy the practice exam course, or maybe I get two or three people that buy the full course. But on average, you can see that's a really good return on investment. Spend $150 to get 500 or more in profit. And it's kind of a no brainer for me that even if I get one sale, if I sell anything, my practice exam course is the lowest, the cheapest thing that I sell is between $150 to $200, depending on the course. So if I spend $150 and I sell one of anything at a minimum i'm making 150 so at a minimum i'm breaking even if i sell anything so the fact that i average two to three sales per month i am uh, utilizing google ads correctly and turning a profit by getting people to go from google click on the ad download the lead magnet get on my email list and you end up buying my course and that's it just five dollars per day to make sure i rank number one for for highly compared for for the Keywords that I can't rank for in SEO because they're too competitive. Something like the word CPCU, I might rank. I think I'm like fifth or sixth in line right now. And to be number one, I use Google Ads and, and I put my ad up there number one. So when people are searching CPCU, they see big bold letters, free CPCU practice exam. So it's really enticing. People click it when they're searching that search term that I'm not ranking number one for yet. But using Google Ads, I can get that number one placement, get more traffic to my website, and convert them into sales. And so that's basically how I'm utilizing Google ads. And I've tried to scale it up in the past. And actually I went from my, my $5 per day ad spent. I think I bumped it up to like $30 per day. Cause my you know, logic says, okay, you're converting, spend 150 to make 500. Okay. You double that, triple that, quadruple that. Let's say you spent four times that I was, okay. That should be $2,000 in profit now. Well, it didn't really work that way. And I tried a bunch of different things and really my sweet spot ended up being, Five dollars per day, hundred fifty per month to get two to three sales. When I increased the budget, I was spending a lot more. The spending went up, but for some reason the sales didn't follow. And that's something I had to analyze and check out a little bit more and dive into a little bit deeper. But my hypothesis was that it's just not a big enough marketplace to 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 sustain that much ad spend. That there's not hundreds of people out there every day buying these courses. That really there's only there's there's people searching for information out there. There's plenty of that, but they're not out there all buying courses right now. So I'm not getting that quadruple in sales because there's not enough sales necessarily out there to go around. And so I got to tweak my campaign and I am going to double it actually within the next month or two. I'm going to go up to $300 ad spend and play with the tweak it, try different, a couple different strategies and new keywords because that's part of the problem. You got to dive into your Google ads and see what you're spending money on and, and what your conversion click through rate and, and return on, on ads is. But anyways, that's, that's just to answer the question. Okay. Why didn't you double it and make double the profit? Well, that's why, cause it didn't work that way. So got to figure that out and play with Google ads a little bit more, but that's how, what I started using around 2017, just to get a couple extra sales, two to three extra sales per month was an extra 500 to $1,000 per month. So the, the Google ads strategy is working for me right now. Just got to tweak it and figure out how to get, get more conversions from this strategy. 
And that just about does it. That is what I'm using for scaling traffic. And again, I showed that I've got about 5,000 unique users per month in traffic. That's converting into about 150 to 300 email subscribers every month. So that's really it. That's what I'm doing to scale my business, utilizing traffic, primarily organic traffic. It's SEO, search engine optimization, and blogging. A couple social media strategies, primarily YouTube, which is all evergreen content. I don't post daily YouTube videos. I'm not a vlogger. I posted four to five videos per exam out there. It's evergreen, sits out there, ranks on YouTube. That brings in the views, subscribers, and email subscribers. That uh, also slide share. I just take my slides, post them to slide share, and eventually I'll start playing with LinkedIn, but Facebook, Twitter, not for me, not my market. So move away from those and focus on where your market is. For me, that's YouTube, SEO, and then paid ads on Google because Facebook ads didn't work. So focus on the Google advertising. So that wraps it up for this episode of the online business case study. And I'm actually excited to announce, I think this is the first time I have potentially announced this, but I am writing a new book and it ties right in with this subject of using your day job to build an online business. The book is titled, Use Your Job to Quit Your Job. And it's how you can take an aspect of your day job, like I did with Associate PI and the CBCU designations, and you can take an aspect of your day job and turn that into your first online business that helps you quit your job. That's exactly what I did with AssociatePI.com. That is the business that led me into full-time entrepreneurship. It was really just a stepping stone until I found other passionate projects and profitable projects that I'm passionate about where I could start other businesses. I used Associate PI in my day job to start my first business, learn everything, create an incredibly profitable business that helped me step into entrepreneurship, helped me start other businesses that eventually led me to the entrepreneur ride along where I am now and building another profitable business. So this book is all about how to find that business idea and validate that idea and get started using your day job to start your first business. So you can check that out at the entrepreneur ride along.com slash job that slash J O B to pick up that book. And that just carries on with these, the concepts that you're learning here in this case study, but I'll show you exact instructions on how to find the idea and validate the idea. And that's use your job to quit your job is the name of the book. And again, if you want to copy this online business, I'm putting together a little mini course on how you can replicate this business model. That's over at the entrepreneurridealong.com slash OBCS1. That stands for Online Business Case Study Season 1 slash OBCS1. That's where you can download this mini course and copy this business model. And that does it for part five, part one. So remember, this is going to be a two-part episode here about scaling this business because a lot has gone into that. So that does it for part five, part one of part five, I should say, in the Online Business Case Study and you can follow the full case study at theentrepreneurridealong.com slash OBCS. So thank you for following along. I appreciate you tuning in for the full episode of part one of part five of Scaling Your Business. Check out part two of Scaling Your Business coming up next in the online business case study. So thanks for listening. I will catch you on the next episode.